As we're all taking our seats tonight, I just want to uh, have a moment of appreciation on behalf of really all of us here for Anna DuVernay for making such a moving and spectacular, thought-provoking, inspiring film. And our gratitude to her and the film and, and, and the uh, film producers for allowing us to show it tonight. So I'd like to welcome you all to the conversation portion of our evening, both to those in the audience at the Miller Theater and to those who are with us by live stream. I'm Suzanne Goldberg. I'm an executive vice president of Columbia University and a member of the faculty of the law school here. A film like Selma calls for conversation immediately, as we're about to have, and for long into the future. Since our time tonight is limited, I invite you to think of this part of the evening and our conversation as a, as a time for sharing sparks of ideas, questions, thoughts, short comments to be pondered now and to be returned to again tomorrow and beyond. Uh, just a few weeks ago, President Obama stood on the Pettus Bridge and said, if we want to honor the courage of those who marched that day, then all of us are called upon to possess their moral imagination. All of us will need to feel, as they did, the fierce urgency of now. He added that all of us need to recognize that that change, as they did, that that change depends on our actions, on our attitudes, on the things we teach our children. And in the context of a discussion at Columbia, I would say on the things we teach our students and on the things that we teach each other. With these words in mind, it's now my pleasure to introduce our conversation partners. I'll just do this very briefly, which is very, very difficult given who's here. Uh, and I want to ask you to Google them all after the evening to, uh, so you can see the full extent of the extraordinary contributions everyone here has made. June Cross, to my left, is a professor at Columbia Journalism School and an award-winning producer and writer with over 30 years of television news and documentary experience. And I'll just say I had to pick sort of one or two of everybody's great works, so it's, it's a very short, selective uh, version. But among Professor Cross's many well-known works is her Emmy Award-winning autobiographical film, Secret Daughter, and the book uh, Secret Daughter, A Mixed Race Daughter and the Mother Who Gave Her Away. Jamal Joseph, next to Professor Cross, is a professor of professional practice at the Columbia School of the Arts. He is a writer, producer, director, poet, and activist, and an Academy Award nominee in the original song category, and the acclaimed author of the memoir and soon-to-be screenplay, Panther Baby, a life of rebellion and reinvention about his life, including his experience as, the, as a member and the youngest spokesperson of the Black Panther Party. Uh, Next, we have Pat Williams, Patri Professor Patricia Williams, who is the James Doerr Professor of Law at Columbia Law School, my colleague, an award-winning scholar, and a leading critical race theorist. theorist. Among uh, Professor Williams' works is the well-known Alchemy of Race and Rights, Diary of a Law Professor. You may also be familiar with Professor Williams' uh, wonderful column, Diary of a Mad Law Professor, which comes out regularly in The Nation magazine. Next to Professor Williams is Professor Francis Negron Montaner, an associate professor of, uh, in Columbia's Department of English and Comparative Literature, a leader of Columbia's study, Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, and of the Media and Idea Lab within the center. She is also a writer and a scholar with many award-winning works to her credit, including Ricondo El Charco, Portrait of a Puerto Rican, which is the first Puerto Rican film to examine issues of race, gender, and homophobia in the context of migration. Samuel Roberts, who I introduced earlier and who's my partner in facilitating the conversation tonight, is Associate Professor of History at Columbia and Associate Professor of Sociomedical Sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health, as well as Director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies here. Among his works is the book Infectious Fear, Politics, Disease, and the Health Effects of Segregation, which explores the political economy of health, urban geography, and race in the late 19th and mid 20th centuries. Now I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Roberts with a reminder to all of you to add your questions to the mix via the hashtag CUSelmaTalk. And at some point in the evening, Radhika Patel, uh, the Chief of Staff for the Office of University Life, will be uh, bringing them uh, to our attention so we can engage with them as well. Sam. All right. Thank you so much, Jose. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, I also want to thank the Office of Programs and Events again for doing this. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to discuss an important film and with such wonderful colleagues as well. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time and to the discussion afterwards. 
I thought it might be a good idea to open up maybe with some reactions. We have, uh, amongst our panelists, filmmakers, we have scholars, activists, um, and I think from those various points of view, I'd be curious to hear your reactions to the film, and then also maybe perhaps a bit of discussion about what the public reaction has been. I imagine that, that many or all of you have been watching the debates of, surrounding the film about its veracity and, and et cetera, et cetera, the tone that it strikes shall we say. I think a number of people have just taken issue with the tone, even. Don't know exactly how that works. We can discuss that. But maybe we could open up with some initial reactions. And from anybody, perhaps Francis. Um, I think one of the things that strikes me about the film um, is how self-aware of an intervention it is in the shaping of public memory. There are mm -hmm. multiple references in the film to the power of media to, uh, to um, as a shaper, as a force, uh, in the way we uh, think about the past and it, the way it relates to the present. And I think there's three kind of distinct ways that uh, the film attempts to produce um, an alternative imagining uh, to other existing uh, more hegemonic ones. One is in the way that it relates elements that otherwise would be absent from the narrative. So for instance, uh, the inclusion of what we can call uh, many instances of pri the private transcript, like James Scott puts it. In other words, um, conversations, interactions that we would have, there's probably no access to what happened, even in a recorded uh, manner, let alone uh, by the you know, complexities of memory. Uh, so in providing us uh, an imagine a proposition of what that private transcript could have been, really, uh, you know, situations to think about relationships between events, between people, between uh, circumstances that we might not otherwise be able to imagine or ask questions about. And I think one of the things that might have been uh, disturbing to some viewers uh, that have expressed, for instance, uh, uh, you know, outrage at the way that LBJ has been represented has to do with what we could call a disruption in the relationships and the palette of affect. Uh, uh, in the film. For instance, um, in many, many uh, scenes in the film, you have that uh, an aesthetic of ugliness to represent race, the, the racist response. And in, in Hollywood film, traditionally, you know, whiteness is associated with good, with pure, with, you know, heroics. And in this film, there's a real uh, uh, disruption of that economy of affect. Uh, and it's, it's repeated throughout uh, as an aesthetic. It's an, not only a pol uh, political in, this, in the big sense of, of representing big political events, but also it's an aesthetic, uh, a, a formal uh, intervention in the ways that we narrate and we tell stories. Um, and I guess I have some ways that I think the film uh, does not entirely succeed in, in some of what it, it po uh, proposes to do. And I also have some thoughts about continuities and discontinuities uh, that the film um, proposes from a, a political, or questions that it raises from a political point of view, but i probably leave that for later. All right. June, I, I, you had some thoughts that you shared with us uh, over the past day or so uh, concerning your reaction. I think this might be a good time if I could. Um, uh, so this is the second time I've seen it, and it was much more emotional for me this time. I, don't, I didn't cry five times the first time I saw it. Um, and I'm not quite sure why it was so emotional for me, but I also began to think, I was you know, sort of picking back off what Francis has said, you know, the power of media. Um, Martin King is portrayed as being very callous, and not really callous about the actual lives of the people who were putting their lives on the line, but the fact that he was willing to put lives on the line in order to achieve the greater goal, um, and that it was really a, a media entertainment show almost in a way I was struck with um, on this viewing in a way that I hadn't been the first time because the first time I was watching it was through the lens of having worked at Blackside which did the original Eyes on the Prize series and we did this story as the documentary and this is the movie not the documentary so you can get very caught up when you're looking at movies and thinking that, well, no, LBJ wasn't like that, and Malcolm never really met with Coretta, and where's Stokely Carmichael? He's not even represented, and what about all the singing that they did when they went back to the church that night after Bloody Sunday and sort of rallied themselves together, and it really wasn't about Martin, it was about the people in SNCC, and, you know, all of those themes are in there, but they represent, different people represent different things because it's a, it's a 
it's a film, it's a movie, not a documentary, which I often have to tell people. That being said, I was also reminded of a film that came out, oh God, 30 years ago called Mississippi Burning. Mm. Um, that was pilloried and ultimately sort of driven underground because it portrayed in Mississippi the FBI as being the good guys and rescuing African Americans from the clutches of the Klan when in fact the FBI was paying Klan members to be informants and they were perpetrating violence against um, those who were fighting the good fight in Mississippi. And as I was sitting there I said, well okay, if it matters what role the FBI played in Mississippi, then it should also matter what role Lyndon Johnson actually played. Um, and I think it does matter, and we can draw, I, I feel at the end of the day there's an emotional truth to the representation of Lyndon Johnson in this film. Um, but in fact there are things that are, that he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't as antagonistic as he was at first portrayed. It didn't, he was already sort of had the, he already had the foundation for the Voting Rights Act um, sort of in hand when the events of Selma unfolded. So it's not a nuanced portrayal of Lyndon, but it's an emotionally true portrayal of Lyndon. And you know, you just have to sort of go back to your history books and go back and watch the actual documentary from Eyes on the Prize where we talked about this, um, this event in order to sort of judge it against history. And to the degree that it does that, I think it's a, a wonderful thing that it sends us back to look at the actual record. Because these are real people. Everybody in there is a real person. You know, and so you're sitting there, it's like, oh, wow, there's John Lewis and there's Diane Nash and you know, there's Mrs. Boynton. And I know those, but I've been in that cafe where Jimmy Lee Jackson was shot and I interviewed that, you know, I interviewed the man that owned that cafe and he told me what happened. And, and that actually happened pretty much the way he said it happened. You know, so there's a lot of parsing of truth from fiction, but at the end of the day, you have to remember it's a movie. Um, I think from two perspectives, um, uh, that it's uh, an important film for young people. I work with young people in Harlem, um, and the contact that I have here on campus and at other places with student activists, um, it is a great reminder of how young the movement was mm -hmm. and how students and the portrayal of uh, John Lewis and Snick and yes, Stokey was missing, uh, but how young people in the civil rights movement was and then uh, just a year or two later people in, uh, in the black power movement were students, 18, 19, 21, 21 years, 22 years old. Diane Nash, John Lewis, mm -hmm. the folks who were really on the forefront and the folks from, with even in uh, the structure of the civil rights movement, uh, pushed the people who were slightly older. Uh, remember, Dr. King was quite young. He died at 38, 39 years old. Uh, pushed them more not to back down, even within the context of the nonviolent revolution. This is an important image to see when our young people through um, television and through Netflix and through Hulu are seeing all kinds of negative Im images, the violent images, the Fast and the Furious 7, 8, 9, 22, whatever number we're up to, uh, can see some Fast and Furious protests and some strong, uh, some strength that's portrayed in terms of taking on the really bad guys of the universe when you're talking about the organization of the United States government and the FBI. Um, as someone who was a young member of the Black Panther Party, I like the bravery and the honesty with which the FBI's counterintelligence program was portrayed, which did so much to attack the civil rights movement and the black liberation movement and anti-war movement, the student movement here at Columbia University. Um, speaking from the other side as a, as a filmmaker who does narrative films, understand dramatic license when you have to take a great movement um, that, that um, and condense it into a, go a great moment in the movement and condense it into something that's two hours of film or two hours and 15 minutes of film, uh, that you will take dramatic license. But from folks who worked in film, and it, 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 this film had a galvanizing effect in terms of those of us who were working with studios and who were working in, you know, slightly inside and outside of the Hollywood system in the way that it was overlooked at the Oscars. Uh, and I was at a dinner in February um, called the Icon Man Dinner, 
and two black women organized a dinner that celebrated black men who had been nominated or had won Oscars in the history of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the Academy. Uh, and my sons joked that when I accepted the invitation to, to go out there to say, well, Dad, you and the other four guys should have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually quite full, and David uh, Oyuelo was there who played Dr. King, and Bradford Young, the young cinematographer who shot uh, the movie, who photographed the movie. And it was a great celebration in terms of acknowledging that, but the work that has to be done. The Academy had a chance to make history in nominating Eva DuVernay as the first African-American female to be nominated for an Oscar. It failed to do that. And in so many categories, it failed to acknowledge great filmmaking and great work for an important subject, an important American film. And that had the effect of making black filmmakers kind of come together in a way to say, we will continue to tell these stories. And we will continue to understand that they are valid when they move people. They're valid when a film like this can continue to have life at Columbia University, but also it's being shown at middle schools and primary schools and high schools and churches and community centers, and that creates a kind of digital revolution that we should all be part of. Thank you. Did, Suzanne, did you want to, I, had, I, I was, did have a follow-up, but it can, it can wait a while. Yeah, please, go ahead. I was going to ask uh, Pat Williams to, to weigh I just, in. I, I, again, I'm, not, I'm hardly a filmmaker, but I am really, really intrigued by the fact that this movie struck me so intimately. It was such an intimate film. And part of it is just having lived through this. I was quite young, but not that young. I mean, I was a very, you know, I just turned 12 or 13 at the time this was happening. So I was very aware and it was very formative. Um, and, uh, you know, one, there are a couple of things that strike me. One is that this is a film that, for which there are transcripts. I mean, a lot of them are redacted, but actually the FBI does have transcripts of many of the intimate moments of this. No, oh, um, I mean private transcript. I meant what happens in private. Yes, but I mean, but, 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 but even what happens in public, my point is that even what happened in public, um, my understanding was compromised to some degree in the making of this film because of the proprietary fight among the King children. Mm -hmm. And that really broke my heart to think about the fact that this actually is now taking place in a world where I think all of our civil rights struggles are taking against, uh, place against a backdrop that is so denominated by proprietary battles over everything. So uh, the intimacy of this was to some degree disrupted by the fact that I, you know, at the age of 12 or 13, had almost memorized every word that King said, and it was disconcerting to have well-written, but clearly not the kind of singing rhetoric um, that were his precise words. They were very, very carefully chosen words, and this was rewritten. So it was a representation with some sense of fiduciary duty, and that's what really intrigues me about the, it is not a documentary, but a film has, of this stature, has some sort of fiduciary responsibility. What was standing between that and its rendering was, again, a kind of proprietary world that I think, um, um, has become the new edge of politics because um, it is proprietary, um, not just about owning particular words. It is, you know, I kept thinking, what would, you know, what will happen in today's world if there is a need for this kind of, and there certainly is a social movement that, is, that we need in all kinds of things, but could we have um, this kind of march on Pettus Bridge um, in today's world? And it seems to me that there are a lot of things militating against that. A lot of that has to do with technology, proprietary interests in technology, you know, battles on the legal field about whether or not you can, who, who and what you can film, who, who owes what, I mean, who owns what. Um, and, uh, and then laws about security and terrorism, because one wonders what a young movement like this would meet in today's world where everything is surveyed. Um, it isn't simply a matter of, you know, uh, putting a, a tap on a, a wire, I mean, every bit of what we do is surveyed, and that surveillance system is something that I don't see college students, there's no SNCC movement. People don't seem to feel personally implicated um, by the political dimensions of the fact that every single part of your lives is being recorded on your instruments or on your computer or by on street corner cameras. And it seems to me that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the apathy in the face of that um, is something that, you know, I would hope that people would take away from this movie. You know, we're not going to have another civil rights movement when we need it. 
um, unless we really begin to oversee and regulate um, who can draw from the palette of representations that are digitally recorded on every single one of us and who can assemble who we are in ways that may or may not be faithful to <laughs> the human beings, the complexity of the human beings we are. Yeah, just very quickly, other thing is really ironic too, you talked about in terms of the surveillance and, and almost kind of how we gladly gave that all back in the face of 9-11 because the government said that, you know, people fought against counterintelligence, pro the Freedom of Information Act. But you look at the image of the police and you look at the image of the police today, the militarization of police, and in the way they show up in poor communities and the way they show up in the shootings that's going on, you look at that and you go, not that much has changed except the weapons are better and the body armor is better. But that same kind of presence- Jim Clark looks quaint compared to police officers in Ferguson. Right. Uh, yeah. The horses and billy clubs are exactly. nothing compared right. to Bearcat yeah. armored vehicles. That's right. You know, but I think each generation has to invent its movement for itself. I don't think this generation, I mean, you know, we sort of saw with the big, with Occupy, the beginnings of a movement that didn't really have a direction and a strategy or tactics. Um, but then oddly enough, out of the same generation, we're seeing now what I would think of as a second civil rights movement surrounding the use of cell phones to capture police misconduct. And we've now got just in the last week, three policemen who are suddenly, you know, their stories are unraveling as a result of individuals with cell phones who are, you know, engaged in revolutionary, the revolutionary act of recording a cop, you know, and unraveling the stories that the police try to tell. So I think it's, you know, I always, you know, there's a part of me that's, you know, nostalgic for, you know, like the good old days when we were marching. But, you know, the rev we, that, that movement accomplished what it could accomplish. And now we're in a new world and a new age. And, you know, your generation is going to have to figure out what revolution you're going to create with the instruments at hand. You know, this is why I think net neutrality was such a huge victory, you know, that we still have some control, even though they're watching us all the time, you know, they can't watch all of us. <laughs> you know, Francis, one of the things I, I wanted to, I actually wanted to ask you, Sam, also your, your thoughts. I just wanted to weigh in a, a small bit, which is that, you know, most of my life as a lawyer has been as a law reform lawyer, mainly on LGBT and HIV. Uh, related issues. And one of the things that struck me watching Dr. King and the group strategize, and I saw this more the second time watching the film than I did the first time, was how uh, profoundly contemporary the yeah. political strategy was, right? The sense of how to mix the public attention to the issue with the on the ground organizing and the lawyers sort of doing what they could to secure the right to march and the, the tensions in the social movement, right, that were there then, that are, are, that are present in any social movement, right, that, that run through every social movement. And one of the challenges, and I, I think I, I see this with, uh, in talking with students often, is the expectation that, you know, there is a social movement that has a vision and, and it's not successful unless it sort of achieves that vision and lockstep, and it's never been that way. And part of what you see is even with the diversity of views and the diversity of strategies, there is this way that a shared end goal uh, come at from many different perspectives can be moved forward. There are ways to get there. And I think that for me is part of what is inspiring and reinvigorating when I think about steps that we are all, or each of us is trying in different ways to take today. But Sam, do you want to weigh in with your, some of your thoughts about the film as well? Actually, I think Francis, you just wanted briefly, to do a quickly follow-up. Yeah, there. I just want to briefly comment on, on, on some of the things that uh, Pat and June mentioned which I think one of the things that struck me politically of, of the film precisely had to do with, I mean, many people have pointed out the continuities, the police brutality, that kind of thing. But some of the things that struck me are the discontinuities. Uh, one of which is that uh, although the film uh, attempts to uh, create a, a private sphere for Martin Luther King and include women to some extent in that narrative, uh, we're still talking about a movement that had a clear leader a model uh, of organization that I think has become impossible. Uh, so I think one of the questions that, that the film asked for me is that is precisely has to do with how much things have changed in terms of how we conceive of social movements. For instance, we have a huge social movement in this country around immigration rights. Does anybody know who the leader is? There is no leader. 
you know, there's a multiplicity of actions in various fronts uh, with various tactics and various relationships to each other using media, which is something that the film and the moment, and, uh, both the moment and the film capture and anticipate that that will be a, a very important aspect of, of mobilization, but with the contradictions that you, uh, that have been uh, mentioned or the paradoxes of this new digital moment. Um, so in that regard, I think one question to, to be explored is, is actually not only the continuities that, or the questions that the film uh, raises that we might recognize as still problems to this day, but also the discontinuities, because that does raise the questions of strategies, tactics, and, and modes of mobilization. Yeah, I, I particularly like that point as well. I, I, one of my reactions to the film, this is my, as well my second time seeing it, and I'm also having a different reaction to it as well. I do have, first of all, I'm a, I like the film. I, I'm, I'm not a filmmaker, so you all may take issue with it. I, I like the way it was executed. I, I thought the acting was particularly good. I'm, again, I'm not even a film critic, so I'll put that out there as well. But um, I also have, and this goes back to something that June said earlier, I do have some questions about the differences or what are the elisions or the very fine lines between dramatic license, and even though I am a historian, I will allow dramatic license. I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't kind of fetishize the archive and every minute detail has to be, um, you know, in place and absolutely quote unquote correct. But at the same time then, I believe that there should be literary license, but there are some things that give me pause. So for, as June pointed out, what does it mean not to have a Stokely Carmichael there and just a Malcolm X to represent a different way of thinking about a civil rights movement. Have we inadvertently recapitulated or reiterated you know, a very popular liberal narrative, which is that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement and we all lived happily ever after? And that's clearly not the case 50 years later where voting rights are you know, in high jeopardy as we began thinking about this. So I, I, there, this is, there is a moment where Stokely Carmichael is telling Martin King, why don't you just say the words black power? It's not that difficult. And, and, and June will tell you because it's in the, uh, the documentary. I think it might be the one that you produced in, the, in the, the, the ep one of the episodes that you uh, worked on, June. Mm -hmm. So there is this moment where King is not the only game in town. And he's not the challenging figure that we would like to believe. He is challenging, but there are others who are pushing in different directions. There's also a way in which I think in this film we are thinking of King as tying voting rights to economic rights. And he, I don't think he had quite yeah, done that just yet. yet. I think yeah. The, yeah. the line that what good Happy is an integrated 66. lunch counter 66, if you yeah. can't buy a burger, I think is something that he actually said in early as 66, and I want to say it was 67 when he's moving towards mm -hmm. the Poor People's March. Right. And it's really, and here's where, where the literary license I think is acceptable to a point. It's really there when LBJ is sick of him. It's really in 67. Like, I don't think Martin had really done the public critiques of Vietnam uh, in 65. In the, in the film we have him saying, oh, you can send troops to Vietnam, but not, I'm not sure he's really saying that publicly. Whereas in 67, he has that moral crisis and says, I can no longer be just about civil rights, just about voting rights, and think that's fine without critiquing American imperialism. So there is a right. bit, kind of, there's a bit of crushing of a very complex four years into one year there. I mean, those are my immediate reactions. Yeah, uh, yeah and that great speech, of course, at Riverside a year before he was killed on uh, Riverside yeah, Church, exactly at right. poverty, poverty, racism, yeah. and war, yeah. and really connects those things. But there's something else that, and I agree with that, that point that June made, but the other thing I think that it did do, and, and again, knowing what film does for filmmakers and for aspiring filmmakers, for young people, it's the emotional truth. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that a few of us watched it, and this is my second time seeing the film, and fought back tears. And that, I think, will inspire two things. Um, for, for people to be, to understand that activism can be an occupation and an advocation, that it's cool to be active, it's cool to question and critique and to whatever form, uh, Francis, as you said, the movement takes, you know, the new models. Um, and that they'll go back and investigate and mm -hmm. watch Eyes on the Prize and read the books and go, it didn't really happen like that, it happened this way, and that's, that's great. Anything I think that opens the door and spurns that interest in that way is exciting to me as a filmmaker and as an, as an educator. I mean, the biggest 
aha moment for me was just tearing down that sort of stone image of Martin King in front of the Lincoln Monument saying, I have a dream. If I have to see that thing one more time, I'm going to die. You know, but I mean, here we have a Martin King who actually is a father, he's a husband, he's a womanizer, you know, and all those facets of him are represented. And I actually found that really fascinating. And I love the way, I thought she handled that really, really well. Whether or not they were true, I don't, you know, who knows, who cares? It was, so, at least I had to think about and re, readjust the narrative that is so often presented of King, especially in February when we have to, or in January around his birthday, when we all have to watch that daggone speech as if he never made any other speech in his life. Uh, Pat, go ahead. Uh, can, I, can I just add one thing? One of, I, again, I, I was, got carried away by the emotion as well, but I'm also suspicious of the, emo the way the emotion was structured in terms of how to use that for current political purposes or what one can do within the university, since that was the question we were yeah. asked. Um, um, or, or as a lawyer, maybe that's the question I heard, but, <laughs> um, which is that it has a kind of emotional truth structured around good and evil. And so it's striking that, you know, if we, are not, if we don't have a Martin Luther King right now, we also don't have a J. Edgar Hoover right, right. now. Um, and so it's a much more dispersed Cheney. sense of political, well, right I mean, now. We, we absolutely have the surveillance, but it's, it's that invisible mm -hmm. panopticon where yeah. we don't know whose eyes, and, it's, and it is a multiple. And we do it to ourselves. Yes, it's, it's a, well, we do it to ourselves, but it's, it, we, the, it is clearly being done to us, too. Yeah. And any time you look at I agree, or if you actually read the USA Patriot Act, it is being done to us. If you look at what's happening in Spain, uh, Spain just passed a gag law, supposedly. Um, which says you can't have you can't uh, film police with your cell phones. Everything mm -hmm. that we're kind of worried about here, you can't demonstrate within a certain number of feet of the city hall and so forth. Um, and it's a quite extreme one with huge fines associated with it. And the response to it was really quite a wonderful bit of performance art. If you, if it's, it's online, I think it's gone viral. A mm -hmm. YouTube video of thousands of people individually filming themselves sent into a central thing, and then they projected it in front of the town hall of the first holographic um, protest, protest um, out in front of the, uh, in front of the city hall. Um, and that's wonderful and it's performative, but it also strikes me as being the kind of difficulty of, you know, that, that we, we're going to have holographs, you know, as perhaps a form of our freedom of expression. Will that have the same power as blocking a bridge? Because you can walk right through a hologram. <laughs> Bull Connor can ride his horse right, all, right over it. And I, I, I think it's expressive, but it is, is it the kind of intimate human expression that is going to motivate the politics, I think we need to, to push back against um, the, the sense that um, unless we conform, we're all going to be in danger. But it's an unseen danger, it's an unnameable danger. It's, it doesn't have um, a head or a heart. It doesn't have a J.F. Hoover or a Martin Luther King. And that's, that's a, a diaphanous kind of new danger. And in some ways, I think the power of a film like this, especially for people who are used to learning visually and used to learning through powerful emotional stories, is to help create the entree into a reminder about why it is so important not only to do what one does on the internet or in the holograms, but uh, to, to do it in person and to engage in person. Let me just uh, pose, time is flying here, so I want to pose a, a couple of the questions that we received via Twitter and then I guess everybody, um, just out of respecting the time, has about a minute to respond to either of these, yeah. any of these, or, or uh, anything else you'd like. Is this um, the lightning round that you told us about? <laughs> What's that? You Sorry. promised a lightning round. Lightning this round. Yeah. This yeah. Lightning, lightning round, exactly. Lightning round. Okay, great. Exactly. The buzzers are ready. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, so I'll just consolidate a couple of them here. And, and one is, uh, how do you think that conversations like this at Ivy League universities, elite institutions, can affect how people think about these issues in the real world? And a second is in light of events like the killings in Staten Island and, and North Charleston. How do you think contemporary Americans can protest in a meaningful way? So these actually intersect to some degree with the conversations we're already having. Uh, but let me um, turn it to the lightning round for each of you to share your thoughts briefly. I mean, you guys are going to graduate from here and go out and be judges and... <laughs> lawyers and leaders of movements and you're going to be writing policy papers and working for a congressman or working in public health and doing things. I mean, I, I think it's very relevant that you begin to question to what degree are you living in your ivory tower and to what degree can you take 
the lessons of Aselma and apply it to your life? Yeah, I, I, I do think that the power of the people, the power of marching and protest is still relevant. It's still amazing to see bodies on the street, bodies at university protesting that. Um, Harry Belafonte talks about the civil rights issue of today. He's been involved from then till now. Um, the issue of mass incarceration, um, the issue of police shootings and murders, and that's something that's going to require bodies, not just holograms, but bodies on the street protesting, questioning universities about divesting from corporations, uh, their portfolios from corporations that are doing businesses with this uh, growing population. Um, I know I'm over a minute, but Common um, and uh, John Legend, when they accepted their Oscar, said mm -hmm. something that bears thinking about, <laughs> that there are more black men in prison today, tonight as we speak, than there were in chains at the height of slavery. That is something to rally around and fight around and define a mass movement mm -hmm. Uh, that we all join in. And then what we would do in those rooms is learn about what was going on in the women's movement and the immigration movement and the gay liberation movement and understand that it was one struggle. We almost have too much information now. And we spend a lot of time digesting. We had less information and more acting, not to be nostalgic, mm -hmm. but to understand that movement is about action. Yeah, I mean, I, I do worry that, the, that social media gives a false sense of intimacy rather than the actual intimacy of what that movement represented and so that I can project a hologram but still be behind walls, still within my gated community, still never actually have the kind of encounter of, that was so miraculous about those marches in those days when blacks and whites really saw each other for the first time. And, and I do worry that, you know, that there may be some of that that we can transmit um, with, with, with cameras, but um, I still think we live in very separated, much more separated worlds of imagination about each other. Um, and the only way we overcome that is actually by having our bodies on the line for and with each other um, and not from a distance. Um, um, I think I just want to comment on the question that Suzanne posed. I think it's very complex. Um, how do we, let's say in a space like Colombia, which is a space of enormous privilege, uh, the question becomes, uh, how do we mobilize that privilege to undermine the foundations that produces it to some extent? Uh, and I think a, a, a practical question, I guess for everyone, and I certainly face this question myself, uh, being part of the Ivy League, is what, what is it that we can do with the resources, the symbolic capital that we have uh, in order to uh, transform uh, our society. And that don't th I don't think it's an easy answer. I don't think it's a, a inherently a question of just saying, we go to the streets together or, you know, these, these are complex questions that we face every day uh, in, our, in our lives as we become professionals, as we become members of the elite, if we're not already. So I think that that is, you know, I think a question for all of us to talk about, because I don't think it has an easy or simple answer. I'm, I, th I have a bit of a different perspective on that. In terms of what, I, what students could do here, I think 50 years ago, each of the volunteers that we see in the news, the young volunteers that we see in the newsreels, not all of them, but many of them had parents at home and said, what is this you're getting involved in? This is dangerous, it's silly, you're gonna be labeled a communist, are you gonna get a good job? Is this why we paid tuition money for you to go to college, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that has not changed. I think there is a game in elite education that that hustle is still there, right? There's a hustle that's gonna scare all of us into believing if we don't you know, have the right major and get the right GPA, we're gonna all be just living on the streets. As, you know, there's that rat race. And I see it in my students, where they're just you know, really just burning themselves out at age 19. Not a very healthy way to go about an education, I would say. Um, I think there are many examples today that prove that to be a lie. There are many people who were activists coming into college, coming into Columbia coming into Barnard, coming into Harvard, Princeton, a lot of places. Um, I don't know about Princeton, but... 
I jest with Princeton. Um, and have made, you know, very uh, fruitful, and I don't mean monetarily, but, you know, they're feeding themselves, but I mean very rewarding careers, fruitful, um, with, what they, with, with what they did. Um, I've, I'm not sure, I, I, I agree with Francis on the point about, you know, can we, can we leverage elite status to dismantle the foundations of, of that system? That is, yeah, that is the problem of the age. On the other hand, there is a way in which if the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house, you know, maybe you can steal the tools and build your own house and to kind of, you know, rephrase the, the old line. And that you can take what you learn here and do something that's not part of the hustle that's being sold to you. There are I ways just want to, to clarify that, that. I, I don't I disagree that, um, that that is a choice people can make. Uh, definitely, and students do. Um, I'm just raising the, that this is a, a large question, um, yeah. that some people make that choice, uh, which doesn't totally abolish the contradictions and the paradoxes of it, uh, but yet can make a contribution to, uh, to, to the dialogue and to the process. Um, so I just want to, so I'm not saying that people are not doing it necessarily, I'm just saying that it is a complex question uh, and, it, and it confronts us with uh, a myriad of, of choices um, and people are not all making the same choices um, and that even the choices that we might find to be the correct choices or the, the right choices politically are, are still, you know, uh, begging more, more questions. I mean, it's not the end. I mean, just saying I'm going to be an activist is not the end of the questions, I guess. Absolutely. Um, and I'll, I'll just pick up and echo that one of the things that I sometimes see is that students feel that they have to choose between being an activist or a serious student, or being an athlete or a scholar, or an activist or an advocate. And I think part of what you're hearing from all of us in different ways is that those, are, those also are false dichotomies, right? One can and, and ought to really engage in the many different ways of, of participating and thinking about these questions and learning about them, right? And so on many questions, we are all at the same time students and teachers. And it's important in some ways to remember that because then we take some responsibility both for learning and for sharing what we've learned. And I think that is a piece that's also invaluable for each of us as we think about where, where to go next. And I thought I would just uh, close our evening by sharing one other um, point that President Obama made on Pettus Bridge. Uh, which I think also follows to some degree on this question, which is that if, he said, if Selma has taught us anything, it's that our work is never done. The American experiment in self-government gives work and purpose to each generation. Selma teaches us as well that action requires that we shed our cynicism. I'm not sure everybody on the panel would agree with that, but I'll just, he, that's what he said, quote. <laughs> Uh, for when it comes to the pursuit of justice, uh, we can afford neither complacency nor despair. On behalf of the Office of University Life, I'd like you to join me in thanking the panelists, and I invite you to continue the conversation both this evening and beyond. Thank you all very much.